Well, hello, Kennard Park Community Church. If you are watching this video, it is because we have had to postpone our public gatherings due to the coronavirus threat. So we're not sure how long this is going to be ongoing for, but the board and a uh, committee they've established to address this matter will be working on that. And uh, you've gotten some information through the newsletter, and they will continue to see, we will we've continue to see that you get more information, detail, and direction on what we're doing and how we're going about that. And uh, for the time being, we just want people to be as safe as we can. At the same time, we just want to figure out how to serve one another in this time to continue being Jesus' church, not running away from this, but running into it wisely and in the proper way. And just to thinking about how we can continue to serve one another and serve the community around us uh, so that we continue to be Jesus' church even in these times and just relying and trusting in our God and His sovereignty in all of this. So... Uh, just thank you uh, for settling for this. It would be so much better if we were to together uh, so where we could shake hands and embrace and just be with each other in that way. Uh, and hopefully that will happen soon. So I'll pray to that end. And uh, yeah, just continue to stay tuned. Uh, more announcements and details will follow here this week as we figure out what to do. So be praying, again, like I said, be praying uh, for that with us as we, as we do this. Uh, but anyways, let's have as much fun as we can with this right now. Now just think about this. You can do church in your pajamas on Sunday morning. Now I don't recommend that you do that, but that uh, it's probably good to kind of get up and go through the motions in some regard. But anyways, I'll leave that to you to figure out. Nobody's going to know except Jesus uh, exactly how you're going to be taking this in. So there you go. Why don't we just take this opportunity here and pray together. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this uh, opportunity under these circumstances to still be able to open the Word of God together, to still in some way worship together, continue to knit our hearts together in the Holy Spirit, even from a bit of a distance now as we're all in our various homes. Uh, Father, we know that you are sovereign over this uh, matter and this threat of this coronavirus. Uh, we know that you this hasn't caught you by surprise. Uh, isn't something that you didn't see coming, isn't something you can't handle. We know you are sovereign and in control and we can trust in you. Continue to give us wisdom on how we're going to best honor and glorify you and a little bit of insight into what your purpose for this could be as far as it goes for us serving you in this, serving one another and serving the community around us in a way that really shows uh, Jesus for who he is and puts him on display for what he has done for us. So just bless our time. Uh, we trust this matter entirely to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> uh, the topic I'm going to go into today is kind of a one-off. It's uh, answering the question, what is our mission as a church? Um, I've discovered over time that there's a lot of confusion about that. A, a lot of us will just assume that it is something. We've just come, been kind of running with everybody else, running with the herd so to speak, and we've never really taken the time to ask that question, what is the mission of the church? What is our mission as a church? And for that, I'm going to be looking at Mark chapter 1, verses uh, roughly 14 to 20, looking at some bits and parts of that to help us identify our mission. But there has been no shortage of missional talk in the church world today. Now, you may, may be new to church or have just never heard the term missional, or you're using the term missional, but you've never stopped to ask yourself, well, what does it mean? It's just you've heard it and it's been attached to certain actions and events and it, it's kind of taken on some meaning in that regard. Um, yet, regardless of all the talk, there is a great deal of misunderstanding of the mission of the church and what it means to actually be missional. Uh, we have bits and pieces of it. Um, we think we have it, but we're not necessarily living in a missional way. And that's what we want to look in here to, to, to this morning. Pardon me. <coughs> Um, so let's just look at a brief definition of what missional could be. Uh, missional has to do with being a missionary. It's that simple. Uh, all you have to do is ask yourself and think about what does a missionary do, and you're going to be getting much closer to the definition and meaning of the concept missional. So a missionary will prepare to go and bring the gospel to a people group, and once they've done as much preparation as they can from their home, uh, from, from whoever is training them, the time comes when the missionary has to go to the people group to which they feel that God is sending them. And, t and, that, and the missionary goes and simply lives among them as one of them. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> and so the missionary, like I said, becomes one of them over time, learning their way of life, living their way of life, and in the process, gaining great and personal insight into their way of life 
and they come to a place uh, where they are learning how the gospel can speak to these people in a way that is truly good news to them. And that's important. Uh, as you spend time with people, you get to see where, you know, they're behaving like the image bearers they are. And you can see places where there's brokenness and there's sin. And the gospel is going to affirm some things and the gospel is going to confront some things. And as you spend time with people and you really get to know them, you can understand how to do that in a loving way that actually sounds like good news. And that's really what it means to live the missional life. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, think of any missionary from the past, of the great missionaries that we're all aware of in, in some of our Christian traditions and circles. Uh, think of those missionaries that we support today as Kennard Park Community Church. Think about what they've had to do to go and, 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 uh, and serve uh, to bring the gospel in the ways that they are and the processes that they have to go to and the time that they will spend living with the people whom they are trying to reach. Now, I want to just, just dispel some, some negative thinking about this here. The missional life is not something sneaky. It's not something that we're something tricky that we're doing that has some ulterior motive like like a bait and switch. You know, it's not like let's go and be really nice to people and invite them in and hang out with them in order to ensnare them into our faith. It's not that at all, as many people may twist it to be. No, instead it is something constrained by the love of Christ. A mission to reconcile people to their God in Him. And it can, this is really what we all need, is to be reconciled to our God. There are many different beliefs and faiths and so on and, and worldviews out there that people embrace and, and live by, but how many of them are actually are presenting a, an accurate picture of who God is and what God has done? Well, uh, we would hold that that is Christianity, and that's what Christianity does. And uh, it, that's why it's very important to understand that and to be able to uh, embrace that in Jesus. That's just simply the way of salvation. And so we really need to be reconciled to our God, and that's what the missional life is about. That's what it means to go and spend time with these people and get to know these people. Uh, they get to know us, uh, uh, and they get to see us seeking to follow Jesus and what that looks like through the good and the bad, because we know we don't get everything right. We do well one day, we mess up the next day, and, and it's just good for people to get in and see that and to see how the gospel works in our own lives, and then that can help make sense to help me apply in their lives. And that's what the missional life does. It's all about living life on life with people. Uh, missional is the life that missionaries live, whether national or international, whether local or foreign, whether right here in our own neighborhoods or abroad somewhere else. We do this in order to bring the gospel to those who have yet to believe it. And like I said, uh, the missional life is the life on life. So missional is not just merely doing social good. Social good, which is good, but you know, social good for goodness sake, uh, really at the end of the day is just atheism. Uh, social good is actually intended to be inspired by and motivated by the gospel. It is to be explained by and grounded in the gospel. And things like social good are intended to create the platform and opportunities we need for verbally communicating the gospel to those who are not yet believers. So we need to note here that missional is always aimed at bringing the gospel to bear on people's minds, hearts, and lives. So let me ask the redundant question at this point. What is our mission as a church? Well, our mission is always the gospel. Therefore, if you believe that the, uh, the missional life is just doing good to others, but yet you're not learning how to communicate the gospel or taking those opportunities or even realizing them, then you're not really living the missional life. Now, more often than not, this also speaks into this also opens up another relevant and pertinent area that we need to address. More often than not, we think people what people really need and the issues that they face, the things that they struggle over and their brokenness, we what we think is they, they need instruction how to think and how to do life in its various aspects. You know, there are three steps to this, there are seven steps to that. People struggle and fail with finances, so we must do a financial series and give them good financial principles and instructions. People struggle and fail in their marriages and families, so we feel we must do marriage series and retreats. And don't get me wrong, these are good things. They are helpful and necessary, and we should do them, but they are far from the main issue. The main issue is always the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of God. It is always that. The gospel is always the answer, it is always the solution, it's always the means. Everything else is fundamentally affected by the gospel. Now let's see if we can explain how this works. Uh, we come, you know, first of all, we come to believe in Jesus for salvation from sin, death, and judgment. And that's great. 
You know, we come to believe now we have Jesus. We have received him. We now belong to God. Uh, we are his children. Uh, we ought to celebrate that because all of heaven celebrates it. However, we, we, we often treat that as the end of the gospel when it is only the beginning of the gospel. So we hear the good news, we are convicted, we repent, believe, and are baptized, and we trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. In a word, we receive Jesus. However, even though Jesus has come to take a special place in our hearts, we fail to realize, and maybe it's from our own unwillingness, but probably more often and more likely, we just haven't been discipled uh, further than that to realize the numerous areas of our minds, of our hearts, and of our lives that are not yet submitted to Jesus. So coming to Jesus doesn't mean everything is set in order and everything is in place. And I think many of us who have been followers for Jesus for any length of time will realize that when I came to Jesus, it was great. Um, uh, you know, I know God now, but yet so much of my life is still out of order, still disordered here. You know, how does that fig how does that figure in? Well, let's carry on exploring this a bit more here. Um, you know, we enter into the justification per, uh, 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 position of the gospel. That is, that when we come to Jesus, we are we who are sinful, we who uh, really deserve judgment and wrath, are declared justified. We're declared forgiven, and that's the position in which we come to live in when we first meet Jesus, and that's the position we live in throughout our whole entire lives, and that's awesome. But what we don't move into or through is the sanctification process, that process where God continues to change us bit by bit and piece by piece, and uh, missing out on that is not so awesome. Like, uh, sanctification is the long, hard road. Um, you know, It takes a lifetime to let the gospel we've received have its way in every area of our lives, for God's glory, for our good, and for the good of others. We often fail to engage that ongoing process of being saved by the gospel. There are three phases, or maybe three tenses to the gospel. There is the fact that when we meet Jesus, we are saved. We're in. We're good to go, and that doesn't change regardless. But secondly, we, are, we have entered into a process of being saved, the scriptures speak of. And then thirdly, um, we are promised that we will be saved to the utmost, that what God has begun in us, he will most certainly complete. We can look at it this way, that we've been saved, first of all, from the penalty of sin, which is death and judgment. We are in the process of being saved from the power of sin over our lives. That's what we're, exper that's what we're supposed to be experiencing. That's the sanctification process. And thirdly, uh, when Jesus returns, we'll be saved from the presence of sin forever, and it will no longer be an issue, and we're all looking forward to that day. Amen? And I'm sure a bunch of you just said amen to that. So that is, we trust in Jesus to save us from sin and the wrath through our sins so that we can be with him forever, but we fail to see the ongoing areas of our minds, of our hearts, and of our lives where we do not yet believe Jesus. So yes, we who believe can struggle with unbelief. It's think about the uh, fellow that Jesus had to deal with once where he uh, exclaimed at the end of an experience with Jesus, I do believe, help me with my unbelief. And we're all like that. We believe, but we also have areas in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives where we are not yet believing Jesus like we need to. In those remaining areas where unbelief and idolatry remain, those dark attics and basements of our hearts, you know, those cluttered rooms and corners where we try not to think about, just think about our own homes in that re in regard. If you maybe you keep a really uh, minimalistic, uh, tidy home, that's great. Uh, a lot of us don't. So maybe the metaphor won't be straight across the board, but maybe, you know, it'll still make enough sense to work here that we've got these things hiding all over us and often we don't realize it. And simply, sometimes we just don't know if we can live without some of those things. We haven't learned how Jesus is better, even though we know he is and we do believe in him. And that's just part of the sanctification process that we're supposed to be engaged in and being discipled through as part of his church. So just think about this now. Where are the areas of your mind, heart, and life where you know you have issues and problems and remaining sin and belief and idolatry going on? Just think about that. What are those areas? And I would say that as you're thinking about that, there's no doubt that there are things coming to mind. You can even ask the Holy Spirit to show you those things, but there's things coming to mind. But I just want to say that you probably don't even know, that you won't even know the half of what's going on there. That's something that God knows, God sees, and God is committed to dealing with. And uh, maybe you're just simply not connecting the dots from your faith in Jesus to the continual problems in your life. You just don't see that, right? Well, this is an opportunity to start asking that question to say, you know, trusting other believers who care about you to speak this truth into your life and love, and also just asking the Holy Spirit to show you these areas. So let me throw out some things here for you that are common issues in our culture. There's many others you can add to this list, but if we are having marriage problems, 
It is because we have not yet believed in Jesus as Savior and Lord of our marriages. If we are having financial problems, it is because we have not yet believed in Jesus as Savior and Lord of our finances. If we are having sexual issues, it is because we have not yet believed Jesus as Savior and Lord of our sexuality, at least to the degree that we need to. If we are having emotional problems or relational problems, it is because we have not yet believed in Jesus as Savior and Lord of our emotions and our relationships, and so on and so forth. Add to the list. Uh, this is you and me. Okay, uh, We're all in this together. We all have these issues where the gospel has yet to speak into. And maybe the gospel has done some speaking, but it certainly has a lot more speaking to do than we probably realize. And God only knows and he'll lovingly and firmly as a good father take us to those places, whether we like it or not. You know, so that, this is just, is just us. We're kind of a hot mess uh, at, on the best of days. You know, We fit the lyric from the Northern Pikes song, She ain't pretty, she just looks that way. Now, we may ask Jesus to do something in these areas to help us out. You know, we know we're struggling, saying we could use a little help here, please, Lord, do something. And we may think we've given over these issues to Jesus or any one of them. However, the abiding problem and the continued cycle uh, of falling into it reveals that this is not the case, that we haven't actually truly given it over yet. Uh, we're hanging on to it tenaciously while asking God for just a little bit of help. That's the problem right there. And that is what unbelief and idolatry does. It's very tricky, it's very deceptive, and it just simply finds ways to stay there. And that's our ongoing struggle. The more we surrender in our hearts to Jesus' salvation and lordship, the more we experience freedom in these areas of our lives as he is allowed to become lord more and more of these areas in our lives. Uh, this is the ongoing process of sanctification, of transforming and changing us to be more and more like Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and who is our Lord. So really, how does this happen? Well, I think I've already said some things to this, but let's just walk through it again uh, 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 one more time. Uh, first, by, con you know, by continuing to hear the gospel and learning to recognize how it applies, how the truths of Jesus apply to these areas in our lives. And this is the work of the gospel in our minds. We need to be listening and thinking and, 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 and uh, processing that gospel and allowing the Holy Spirit and helpful brothers and sisters to help us to see how it applies to the various issues of our lives. So that's the work of the mind. Uh, secondly, as we mentally come to terms with the gospel in the various form, in, in the various ways it applies to our issues and problems, uh, the more we can let our hearts come to rest on those gospel truths for those issues and problems that we face. And that's really what it's coming down to. It's coming down to believing God in those areas of our lives and letting God be God in those areas of our lives. And that's a hard, difficult, long process to go through. I want to emphasize that. But this is the work of the gospel in our hearts from hearing it and then letting it filter down into our hearts into the seed of who we are and beginning to change our lives there at that very important level. Thirdly, as we let our hearts rest more and more in the truths of the gospel and how those truths speak into, you know, how they replace the idols of false belief and transform our hearts, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, the various problems that we uh, uh, have begin to vaporize, they begin to diminish, they begin to leave. And this is the work of the gospel in our lives. And so I really like sharing a diagram at this point, but I simply I don't have the the capability to do that right now under these circumstances that we're in, but just picture this here. Here's your mind, right? We hear the gospel. Let's just say we're first-time uh, believers here. We've heard the gospel. Uh, we've understood it. The Holy Spirit is opening our minds, and, and the gospel, we allow the gospel just to go fall down right into our hearts, and Jesus comes to take a special place in our hearts. And we're like, wow, I know the God of the universe. I can think back to when I first became a believer, how amazing it was to have the joy of the Lord in my life. There was simply nothing else like it. But here's Jesus having a special place in my heart. And uh, as I carry on in life, I realize that um, as much as Jesus has a special place in my heart, I'm having issues in my life still. Um, I'm having issues with my, my, my emotional health. And there's, I don't, I'm probably oversimplifying this a bit. There's, a, there's other issues that involve this, but we can't go into all this at this time. But let's just kind of reduce it and generalize it just a little bit here for the sake of, what we're, uh, of this illustration here. But I'm having emotional issues. I'm having uh, financial issues. I'm having marriage issues. I'm having this kind of an issue and that kind of an issue. And what I realize is that, is that even though Jesus has taken the special place in my heart, 
in my heart I'm still hanging on to these things myself that I'm Lord of my money, I'm Lord of my marriage, I'm Lord of my emotions, I'm Lord of my relationships, I'm Lord of that, I'm Lord of this. And we haven't even realized how we need to give those over because they're so deeply rooted and ingrained into us. So what we have to start doing is looking at those things again. We, and how do we do that? Well, we continue to listen to the gospel uh, as it's preached like this on a Sunday morning or as we hear it from one another as we're gospeling and caring for one another. We're hearing the gospel. And, and through that time, we begin to ask those questions. Well, how does the gospel speak to my money? And, you know, we do a little bit of learning there. But then also we got to do some surrendering at that point. When I start surrendering my money over to Jesus, I'm no longer in charge of that. I got, I realize that I'm a steward and he gets to tell me what to do. And that can be a pretty tough thing and be one of the toughest things. It's the same thing with a marriage. I may, you know, that I learn how to let Jesus be more Lord in my marriage. And uh, when he does that, good things happen. I can become a nicer person, a more patient person, a loving person, because I know Jesus is Lord and he's sovereign. And even no matter what may be going on in a particular relationship, um, that uh, he is Lord and I can be at peace and I don't have to take charge myself and play God at that point and cause more trouble. And so as we learn our heart to surrender these different things over like finances, relationship, marriage, and a host of other things, um, that gospel that has come into our minds and down our hearts begins to show itself more through our lives. I can illustrate that with my hands representing all of my life. I begin to live differently. I begin to come across differently over time. And that's really how the gospel is meant to work. And really, that's the mission of Jesus in us and to us. But then it also becomes the mission of Jesus through us to others as well. And that's why it's so important to live life on life together, that we can't do this uh, as a, in a Lone Ranger style. The, uh, the gospel work in us is always a community project. There are very rare circumstances where that is not the case or that is not possible. We're always trying to do this together as a family of believers. I always tell my kids you know, in the home here that... Uh, you know, that's usually where we let loose and really be ourselves when the doors close and the blinds are pulled and the real us comes out and you can see all the uh, sibling rivalry and the issues of parents, a child, uh, and child, a parent, and all that kind of stuff. And I always tell my kids and I always tell our, myself as well that and if you can learn to love each other here, you can learn to love each other anywhere. This is actually your training ground. So this is actually a good thing provided that we handle these conflicts and issues in the gospel that we actually learn to do so. And so that's what we need to do as a church as well, because even a family on its own is not enough uh, to do that. We need the broader family of God to help create the, uh, the, the space, the affirming space for that kind of a gospel work. So um, all in all, this is, like I said, the work uh, and process of sanctification. It rests fully on justification. We're not earning our salvation that is given to us freely from beginning to end. We're just working it out in our lives. And eventually it gives way to glorification when Jesus returns and he takes all those loose ends and all those undone things and he brings them fully up to speed and we're everything we are meant to do. So you can see how important it is to live life on life together and how engaging this gospel and how pervasive is it actually. It just goes everywhere to the deepest parts. And that's simply the work of a missionary. That's what it means to live the missional life. And, um, you know, we can conclude here that this is what people need. This is the gospel that people need. This is what they need in their lives. Um, you know, we all, everyone in the world, needs the truths of the gospel applied to the various areas of our lives, leaving no stone unturned, hence the mission of the church. And this is the kind of gospel sharing and application, uh, you know, this is the kind of uh, kind of gospel, uh, you know, an application that's required in most cases. Like I said, it has to be life on life. Living life on life with those who don't yet know Jesus, getting to know them, getting to love them, getting to see what the gospel affirms and what the gospel confronts, as I've already said. Giving these people a chance to see up close and personal what it means to believe the gospel like I said, through our own good and through our own bad. I can think of times when I've actually, as a Christian, had to apologize to non-believers and uh, to get a chance to share the gospel and to show how much of a need I have for this. Uh, getting to a place of trust and sharing the gospel in ways that are truly good news to those who need it, those whom we are called to live among. You know, <clears throat> and, you know, so... You know, all we need, even as believers, we need to keep telling one another the good news of Jesus, the truths of Jesus, as life in this fallen world just wants to beat the gospel right out of us. This is the kind of thing that we need to do. And so big events and uh, doing good things for people in the community are good. They're necessary. We need to be doing those things. 
Um, like I said, it's good to it's a good way to connect uh, to and to bless our culture and our society and our town and our communities. As helpful as various steps are to this end or to that goal, you know, three steps to a better marriage, seven steps to better finances, better relationships, all those different steps. Those are good things that we can use. They do have their place, but the primacy from A to Z is always going to be the gospel of Jesus. If all of our problems stem out of the fact that we're not believing the gospel in certain areas of our life like we need to, then the gospel becomes the answer. Because when we believe Jesus, we really learn to give those things over. That's when change begins to happen through the gospel. And so people like you and me, we always need the gospel, always. And so let me end with this epilogue here. Um, <clears throat> think way back, like way, way back in the Bible storyline, back to when the Lord, through Moses and Joshua, led the people out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land of Canaan. Uh, they had the command and the directive to overthrow and remove the people of the land, to drive them out, for their wickedness had risen to such high levels that it could no longer be tolerated in the world. Uh, they were to overthrow these peoples and to take their land. Uh, just remember, it sounds harsh, but the earth is the Lord's and he gives it to those whom he pleases. As in Jesus' words, the meek shall inherit the earth, Matthew 5.5. 5. Well, as the story goes, they get into the land and they are not able to overthrow all the people. Some remain. And so it kind of raises the question, why did God promise it? Why did he command it and then not finish it? Well, he says later on in the narrative that it was to test them, to see if they would in fact treasure and trust in him above all else and not fall for the unbelieving idolatry of the remaining peoples in the land. This was the process of, uh, uh, they, 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 they needed for further sanctification in their lives. They've been saved out of Egypt. That's just a picture of how we are saved out of Egypt, so to speak. And God is bringing us to our promised land, and he's teaching us how to obey and follow after him through this very challenging world, which is definitely no friend to the gospel and living in the ways of Jesus. And so this is very important, but it also becomes a very important witness to those people who were still remaining in the land. And we know without a doubt that people would see the truth and the power and the work of God in the life of the Israelites, and, and some would come over and uh, join in to them in their faith. And that's the same thing that we can experience here in our culture. So you have to come to Christ, uh, you know, you, 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 you have to, to become a believer and now you are you know you've done this you've come to Jesus you become a believer and now you are wondering why you are still struggling with all these various issues it seems like some things that you know this have this grip on you and this hold on you and you want to know why everything just isn't made good yet well first of all it will all be made good in God's time he has reasons you and I cannot compute for allowing things to continue on as they are but he will finish what he began in you as Philippians 1 6 says Second, you must learn, and really this is really what it comes down to, you must learn the lordship of Jesus over all areas of your mind, heart, and life, over all of you and everything about you. You have to learn to let go of the idols you have come to treasure. Often they are subconscious and hiding in the dark corners of your mind and heart, disguised, and they, they have to be exposed for what they are, and you have to learn to let go of your unbelief and learn to believe in Jesus for those issues. This will be a lifelong process. It will continue till you see Jesus, but rest assured if you abide in him and his word in you, you uh, he, he will eventually do all he said he would do in you and as well through you. If you're just inquiring into the Christian gospel and you don't believe it yet, this is how it could go for you. First, should you choose to do so, you believe in the gospel. You receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. You just do that simply for prayer saying, yes, Jesus I agree to your gospel, uh, you know, step in and take over my life, step into my heart, step into my mind and life. Uh, I belong to you now through what you've done for me on the cross. Uh, so, you know, should you choose to do that, right? Uh, but know that if you do, this is just the beginning of something that is all together new, a whole new journey that is not a bed of roses. It's not an easy thing, but it's real. And God's grace is sufficient to bring you through it. So secondly, um, know you are in for a journey of a lifetime of learning how to submit more and more of your mind, heart, and life to Jesus' lordship and salvation. You are in, if you've given yourself to Jesus, you are saved, and now he is going to see you through that, and he's going to provide, and, 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 you know, and, and, you know, provided that you stay with him through thick and thin. 
So I trust uh, you can see that the gospel is our only mission as a church. We don't want to get distracted from that. We just want to fall into mere social good or doing good things for people. The whole point is we, we, we want them to see Jesus and come to believe in Jesus and follow after Jesus. For that is what is really going to help people at the end of the day, now and forevermore. And that's what we want for them. And just to remember, the gospel is the life, engine, and purpose and goal of the missional life. Amen? Why don't we take this opportunity to close in prayer? And that was a lot, um, but I'm hoping you're able to grab onto some thoughts there that were helpful to you in understanding what the mission of the church is, but also how that relates to you as a follower of Jesus and to us as a church as we move forward together following Jesus. Even as we figure out how does it mean to follow Jesus and be the church during, during this current, uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic in the world today. Father, we just want to thank you for every good gift that you give to us in Jesus. We thank you for every truth, the truths that we don't know yet, maybe the truths we just know in our head but haven't dropped down into our hearts and changed and, and out through our hearts to change our lives. Uh, we just pray that you continue your good mission as we know you will, um, but we're just asking for that. We need that. We need your work in us. And we just delight also to see your work through us as we share what you have done in us with other people. As they get to see that and they ask questions, we can explain that it wasn't because I followed three steps or I did this or that. It's because Jesus loved me. It's because Jesus has done this in me and he can do something like that in you as well. So bless us as we... We we think about the mission of our church and how that mesh how that mission uh, takes shape and, and is fulfilled in our community, in our neighborhoods, and in our town for your glory, and your praise, and our joy, and our good, in the hope of this new amazing world to come when everything will be made right and perfect, and the mission of Jesus will be completed. We're looking forward to that day. In your name, we pray. Amen.